And when I've looked at that scripture before, I have solely looked at the miracle and I get excited about the miracle. So up until yesterday morning, usually I, I get a day a week to study for Sunday. So when you really only, when you work one day a week and it's a Sunday, you have to try and make it worthwhile and good. So I try and study one day, but stuff happened on Friday, different things. It was just, but I still had it up my sleeve. I got excited about this scripture through the week. I thought I'll preach this. And Saturday morning, tried to really mark senso and go with the flow. And I thought, just I was wrestling with it and thinking, ah, this is just, it's a great scripture. I'm just now feeling it. I thought, if it's happened, if I got my hair cut like Samson, I've lost the anointing and it's just gone to far flat. And then we had went for a walk, came back, and then I just kept reading the rest of it. And I thought, right, I've got it, Jesus. Speak, Jesus. That's a point. And then I messaged Gib and I says, look, Nesho, sure far on worship and mourn, but could we please end we speak, Jesus? Like it would be really good to end there if I'm speaking on speak Jesus. And he said, I'm the one uh, leading, but uh, Paul is. And then messaged back and says, you'll never believe us. Paul just did his playlist, the last song he was going to sing, Speak Jesus. So I thought, yes, thank you, Lord. And I, so I end, we, we speak Jesus as well. So I'll now just read verse for verse for Hartman. So Peter and John meet this guy. He's at the temple and he's lame and he's a beggar. And it says every single day he's to get carried to the temple gate, the gate was called beautiful, but he was lame. I didn't just want us to look at the guy's limbs, but the guy was in a very, very difficult period. He'd been lame for birth. There was just something that didn't operate right, but yet he was placed at the gate called beautiful. When you look through the history of Herod's temple, there wasn't actually an obvious gate card, beautiful. There was different theories to fit gate this way. Some thought it was the eastern gate, the card, the the Corinthian gate that was 70 feet tall with gold and bronze. That could have been the, the beautiful gate. The point is that every single day he relied on other people to pick him up, to carry him outside the temple. Hamne being allowed to go inside the temple was tradition. If he was lame or blind, you couldn't serve as a priest, but you were supposed to be allowed in. But it was man-made traditions that they stuck by was like, well, and even allowed in the temple. The guy had to sit outside. So every day he would get carried. He wasn't allowed into the religious system or the day. And used to just sit like a beggar and look at this place called Beautiful. And look at all the happy, clappy Christians gone in, happy, clappy Jewish people gone in. And they used to beg and get money because it was still good as a Jew to be generous, stuck at a gate card, beautiful, and things were just not gone so well. Sometimes we put so much emphasis on happiness as external. If I just get the right things, get the right job, get the right money, get the right atmosphere around a bootman, then it will mark my happy. This guy was in a good place, in a good atmosphere, but he was still sad. Um, do you ever been there in life? I mean, at uh, Hogman, eh? Yes. In the millennium, the year 2000, followed through that. They thought the planes were going to fly through the sky. They never. I was 18. Yeah. Imagine being an 18 year old when its clock struck and it was a millennium party. Like it was supposed to be party every Hogman there, but the millennium party was going to be the party at the end of all parties. It was going to be a beautiful place. It was going to be a happy place. I just mind. Sitting, sitting in the ship, <laughs> to actually say some things. <laughs> sitting in the ship and near boat, it was a pub, and uh, Abdi happy. Supposed to be was built up to be the happiest of happiest times. The party to be our parties, and for some it really looked as though it was. I sat really sad. It was supposed to be uh, the gate card, beautiful. I felt as though I was like the loneliest lost guy on planet Earth. 
And I visibly looked sad because one guy came and says, you know, it looks too happy to be taking out the millennium, did you? I was like, I'm there. I'm here. I don't want to be here. Life's in a mess. Nobody kens it. And the place card beautiful. But my heart was, you can't have fake joy. And we put our thing on, if I just get this external thing, I'll have joy. But you can have everything, yet nothing. You can have everything that this life might have in terms of external things, yet you can be sad because your heart is breaking and you're lost and you're looking for some answer. That night didn't start well. It wasn't good in the middle and it didn't end well either because it was supposed to be the get card beautiful, but my life was in a mess. Didn't it matter for you teen on planet Earth that night, I would have still been grumpy. You could have teen me at the Grand Canyon, and I would have said, it's just another hole in the ground. It's special about this. You could have shown me the Mona Lisa, and it would be like, I could take a better picture of my three megapixel camera and my Nokia 3310. You could, joy is an attitude of the heart, an attitude of the spirit. And then I've seen since then a man going to the Philippines on mission and went to this dump site in Manila. Like a dump site to end all dump sites. You'd think the broth scap is bad. You go to Manila dump site and realize there's a community biding there, there's a church there. You that can fit your walking into it. But you smell fit your walking into it before you see fit your walking into it. And it takes your breath away. And you go, and you think, got your western heat on, thinking, these people are bound to be unhappy and depressed. They're staying in a dump. A dump to end all dumps. Like they had, ah, the waste food for KFC, McDonald's, they were looking through that for something to either eat or sell. And you get the little burns. Scooting about, and now they've got in his underwear. And they've got tops for the bottles that they've teen off. And I can't think game that was playing, but they were happy. They've never heard of an Xbox or a Switch or a TV in the room or broadband. They were just happy flicking taps of bottles. And you think, oh, wow. And then you go into the church and it's still smelly. And the worship band starts and there's joy in the room, and there's a presence of Jesus, and then you realize what's important in life. And then you, you just get a sense of God is good, and He really loves Abdi, and He can bring joy to the, the most hopeless places on planet Earth. And then you visit the toddlers group, and then you hear them singing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And then you're standing with tears. They've got nothing. But they've got everything. This guy, he was at the place card beautiful, but he must have felt it so he had nothing. Could you imagine being carried every day and begging every day, looking for some generous people every day? Like, it was maybe his chums that left him there. Maybe they were good meaning folk. Just helping out their pal. Maybe they used to take a cut of his earnings. You didn't care how the guy got there. He was just carried there every single day to the gate. God, beautiful. Every day I must have felt like Groundhog Day. Nothing going to change. But then something amazing happens. Because things can change quick. Things can change quick. Because he's there one day and a few people fell to the Holy Ghost. Peter and John rock up and it's just another day. The guy's been doing this for years. And his eyes look on their eyes, and so he, he's wanting money. And Peter comes out with, hey, silver and gold, I do not have. He says, I'm skint, but I've got everything. I've got nothing, but I've got everything, silver and gold. I, I haven't got silver and gold. But what I do have, I give to you. 
Sometimes God sharpens us up through lack. If, he, if Peter had a pooch full of coins, it would have been easy just to say, I'm going to give you five, God, here's a few quid. May it go well with you. God bless you. I'm going to the temple to worship my God. Because being generous is a good thing to do. But Peter was scant that day, and God used it for good. But Peter didn't rely on his lack. Peter knew he had everything. And so he says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. He spoke Jesus. We can live this life looking at what we haven't got, get jealous about other people, be miserable, want, 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 and you think, if I just get this, I'll make you happy. Here's two people full of the Holy Ghost, Peter and John, saying, I am scant, but I have a solution. It might look as though I'm in poverty, but I've got everything I am arriving to the temple, and I am going to speak Jesus loud and clear, knowing He's a miracle-working God. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And then it says that Peter put his right hand. This guy isn't he walking since birth. And he starts to lift them up. Even when Jesus does a miracle in somebody's life, they still need to the help the people to get up and walk. It's a picture of the new convert. Rise up and walk for Jesus. You're saved. And a picture of a mature convert saying, I'm still here to help you. He says he put a hand. You understand? People still need a hand to walk for Jesus, even when God is doing a miracle in their life, even when God seems to just transform their lives and we can see that the spark has came into their eyes, we can see there's a spiritual transformation. People still need other people to say, I'm going to help you on the journey. It says that Peter put his hand out. Peter didn't just take a step back and says, God's doing a miracle, rise up and walk. No, Peter says, he's doing a miracle, I'm here to help you. It's a picture of discipleship. It's a picture of an alpha course. People say, well, I only go to the alpha course. I don't need the alpha course. Maybe you should go to the alpha course to help the person that really needs the alpha course. To say, I've been through for you've been through. I'm on this journey myself, but I'm, I'm here to give you a hand with us. I'm here to give you a message when I think about you. I'm here to pray for you. I'm not just going to say, well, you're saved. I'll just leave you in God's hands. No, we'll forget about you. It's saying, look, we're here for you. We're here when you make a mess. We're here when you still swear like a trooper and you say you're saved. We're here for you. You're on this journey. And we're here to mark you and help you in God's journey so you can walk in love and in liberty. Now, up until Saturday morning, that's as far as I got. I thought it was a good sermon. But then I felt as though God was saying, Keep going. He spoke Jesus. He's seen a need. He spoke Jesus. But look what happens after this, because Peter does something strange. And it was like the hell miracle was an object lesson to fit with what happened next. An amazing miracle. A lame man begins to walk. Walks into, he walked into the temple, the place that he wasn't allowed to go before. The place that he might have looked and thought, well, God doesn't love me. I'm outside God's circle. I'm not allowed in. He gets healed and full of Jesus, and he doesn't go to the shops. He gets healed and full of Jesus, and he walks in to God's divine place, walking, leaping, and praising God. And then something happens. Verse 12 of chapter 3. Now, if he was Peter, right, 
amazing miracle, healing miracle. You just seen somebody that was lame for Baal rise up and walk. You go into the temple. Very, very, if I was him, I would have started a healing revival right here. Love it, didn't you? Come on. You have just prayed for somebody. If I was lame for birth, they started walking into the temple. People seeing him start to think, wow, that's amazing. Is that the guy we just seen? It is. It's him. If I prayed for him. If Peter prayed for him, he says, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And if I was Peter, I'd say, okay, okay, look, 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 look. Faust has got an ailment because God healed him. He can heal you as well. Let's start a healing revival. But Peter didn't he? Peter said this. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said, what is so surprising about this? Imagine so many miracles happened, we, we get to say, why, why are you surprised that God can heal people? Because He's God. Why are you surprised that God can turn lives around? Why, why should we be surprised when God starts moving in miracles? He says, why be surprised about this? Why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power or God? Or or godliness. It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors, who has brought glory to His servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release Him. You rejected this holy, righteous one, and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are all witnesses to this fact. Peter said this, you ends, you murdered them. He's why I get to the grace message soon. He says, you, you killed him. You battered him. You left him in tatters until he says it is finished and breathed his last. You thought you killed him. You thought that was the end of the story. You thought if you obliterated Jesus, you would have stopped the movement. But... Our God is a comeback king. It wasn't at the end of the story. You lot killed him, but God had other plans. You lot tried to wipe him out, but Jesus is alive. Peter never started a healing revival. Peter spoke Jesus into the situation and says, Hey, you ends are criminals. And Jesus is alive. You ain't trampled them underfoot, laid them in Joseph's tomb. But you cannot stop the power of Jesus who reigns forevermore. And because of that moment, people get healed. And because of that moment, people get delivered from demonic strongholds. And because of that moment, people overcome by the power of God, the blood of the Lamb, and the word or testimony. Because we serve an overcoming God. You ain't thought the story ended with you. Oh, no, 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 no. That, you thought it was the end of the book. That was the end of a chapter. You thought that was that case closed. You kangaroo court killed an innocent man. But God ain't finished we planet Earth and its inhabitants just yet. He's seen it. Verse 12, he's seen an opportunity. I pray as we go about our lives, we seize opportunities to speak Jesus. It's Jesus that healed the man that was lame. 
He could have spoke about the illness. He could have given him some money. But yet, there is power in the name of Jesus. And we need to get back to the heart of the gospel that there is power in the name of Jesus. The demons shriek at the name of Jesus. And here he goes on. Verse 16. Through faith in the name of this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends. He's speaking to the people. He's just called murderers. And then he calls them friends. You love the Bible. I realize that what you are and your leaders did to Jesus, it was done in ignorance. Like you didn't really care if it was gone on. But God was fulfilling what will the prophets and foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. And then he gave him the gospel of love, the gospel of grace, the gospel of mercy. Now repent of your sins. Turn to God so that your sins might be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. And he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah, speaking about the second coming. He's speaking to murderers. He's called the murderers. How could a grace-filled preacher call them murderers? He says, you killed them. That's just a statement of fact. You hung him on a tree to die. He was innocent of all charges. There were no sin that he could have been found guilty of. God raised him from the dead. But then he comes with the gospel of love. And he says, friends, repent of your sins. Even if you're a murderer. Even if you're a thief, even if you're a blasphemer, even if you're an addict, repent of your sins. Turn to the one that you crucified. Turn to the Lord. And then he says, times of refreshing will come upon you. Times of refreshment will come upon you in the presence of the Lord. He says to the people that just crucified Jesus, one minute you can be a murderer, but the next minute you could be a son of God, a daughter of God, and the refreshment power of the Lord. The one minute you can be an enemy or a holy God, and within a second you're highly favored in His presence. One minute you can be in a place called beautiful, but your heart is sad, and the next minute you can come leaping, dancing, and praising God in his temple with Jesus wiping away your sin in a second because you said, sorry, that's a good deal. We get to believe and say, sorry, God takes murderers and does miracles. The gospel of grace is flung wide to the highways and byways. It's the gospel that says, Whosoever comes to me, I will never cast asunder. I'll never cast one person aside all. That's the gospel of good news to me. This wasn't just about a lame guy out with a temple that got healed and he began to walk into the temple. When I was praying through this, I thought, I can't really relate to the guy. I've never suffered like that. But then I thought, I can exactly relate to the guy. I started to think of the moment I got saved. I started to think before I was out with the temple, and then a relationship with God, and then a holy place whatsoever. But as soon as I repented, Jesus washed away every ounce of my sin, public in things you didn't care about or want to care about, and I walked in through that temple and the Spirit. You get, ma? You might not go to Jerusalem. 
You'll maybe never see the temple, but something happened the day I said, I believe in Jesus. I was seven stone. First, why I'm still trying to work back a while <laughs> to get to, you know, I was wasting means a day and that, right? Then I try the rehab by, right? So, seven stone, sin washed away. And that day, I went in my heart and the spirit, leaping in my spirit, rejoicing and praising God. Because one day I was lost, and I realized I was found. I realized I used to be a prisoner, but God had set me free. I realized I never had hope before, and the moment I realized I have hope, and I'm being honest with you, I can very little about Jesus. I read a few Psalms, listened to a few songs, but I knew I was saved. I'm telling you, you could have lined up every atheist on the face of the planet with amazing qualifications, and they could have given me the reason why God and Jesus was rubbish and didn't exist. I'll tell you, I would have bought every single one of them a lot. And never thought twice about it. And they could have said, well, the big bang theory, no, 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 no. I said, it didn't matter. For I know that Jesus lives. And I know my Redeemer lives. And you might call me arguments and debates and science, but Leonard Ravenhill used to say, a man or a woman or a young person with an experience will never ever be at the mercy of one man with an argument. I've heard a lot of arguments against Jesus and against the divine and against God. I'm not educated enough to battle every argument, but I'm experienced enough to say it doesn't matter about your argument. I have met the King in the Spirit, and for each one of us that's ever given our life to Jesus, and I'll give an opportunity at the end to do that, you've walked through the temple, haven't you? You've walked through the place that you used to be not involved with. I'm not on about church. I'm on about the Spirit of the living God being a reality in your life, and you've come in to the presence because the truth is that Peter spoke to murderers, and as he said was, believe, repent, and you as an individual will hear refreshment and refreshing times in the presence of Jesus. Are you weary? Have you wondered? Turn back to Jesus. Be refreshed. Peter just says, says to a lamb beggar in the name of Jesus, and he was incredibly consistent because when he got to the temple, he says, I've got nothing else. I'm just going to give you Jesus. I'll give Jesus to a beggar. I'll give Jesus to worshipers in a temple. I've got a great gift to give every single person. Let's speak Jesus. And of course, it doesn't end there because it's a three-point sermon. One, speak Jesus. See a need. People come with sicknesses. Pray Jesus. Oh, well, I've did that and it never worked. Speak Jesus. Speak Jesus and let's see what he does. When your question, speak Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 5. So he's went for a beggar, Peter. Then he's went to the people in the temple. He's invited them a moment of repentance, and if they did, could you imagine the refreshment of the Lord that would come upon? Chapter 4. Ach, I'll just read it for verse 1. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by priests. There's always somebody to annoy the party, isn't there? Confronted. I mean, the guy just got up and started to whack in Jesus' name. He's given the gospel. And some people are never happy. And then he's confronted by the priests. They called on the elders and was like, you know, hey, come here and saw this guy out. The captain of the temple guard and some of the Sadducees, these leaders was very disturbed, very disturbed. They had their, cloth, they had their priestly cloths on and they were very disturbed. Maybe it's time that God started disturbing a lot of things that needed 
to be disturbed. That Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees never believed in the resurrection as a rule. They arrested them. Well, that's a bit severe for people that's helping people. Since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of believers now told about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. They think of strength in numbers, but if you've got God, you've got the majority. They ganged up on him. Annas, the high priest, was there along with Cephas, John Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Very religious people always look at the qualifications. If I give you the right to preach, how qualified are you really? Are you, are you qualified to speak in the temple? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't need to rely on yourself in answering these people, for God will help you, rulers and elders of our people. We are being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man. Do you want to know how he was healed? You just see Peter burning with boldness. Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ in Nazarene, the man you crucified by whom God raised from the dead. Jesus is the one referred to in the Scripture where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation, hallelujah, in no one or nothing else. God has given no speak Jesus. If you are struggling for a theology or an explanation or an argument, just speak Jesus. Under heaven by which we must be saved. He just lays a sort of healing in its context and doesn't start a healing and a revival. He just says, look, this is because of Jesus. And you need Jesus. You're only why you're getting saved is because of Jesus. You're not getting Jesus because you exclude th people through with a temple. You're not getting saved because you're a priest or you're a church leader or you're an elder. You're not getting saved because you're well educated and you've been through rabbi school. You're not getting saved because you're in charge of the sacrifices. You're taking the money and you're the treasurer. You're not getting saved through none of that. There's only one name under which you may be saved. And his name is Jesus. He just spoke Jesus. The members, verse 13, of the council, got to love the members' meetings, were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see, hold on a minute here, they could see they were ordinary men. God will take the ordinary and mark something extraordinary. He takes the jars of clay and falls them a beauty. For they could see they were ordinary men, no special training. Hold on, I didn't see this guy's in rabbi school. I didn't see this guy at priestly school. But they carry something that marks people sit up and listen. No special training in the scripture. Stop telling yourself you're not trained enough to speak about Jesus. Stop letting the devil tell you. You need to go away, do open learning at a Bible college to be trained enough to speak it about Jesus. No special training, ordinary men. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. The hell council got together and says there's nothing special about him. However, they've been with Jesus. And this, if you be with Jesus, you'll speak about Jesus. If you didn't be with Jesus, you'll never speak about Jesus. I believe God has got to take people with no specific training, but has got a fond love with Him, and the testimony will be 
they have been with Jesus, we can see as the Holy Spirit force or love or anointing and something happens when an ordinary vessel, when a man given authority speaks about the wonderful name of Jesus, people start to listen, atmospheres start to change, and God is honored. Verse 14, but since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. This is what I can do with you guys. You guys are too hot to handle. Yeah, we kind of give an answer and we kind of shackle you either. You guys, we want to be too hot to handle. They were too hot to handle. They ordered them out. They are 16. They start thinking, what? This is the members' meeting to end all members' meetings. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny can't deny that they've performed a miraculous sign, and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. The healing was just a catalyst for the message. It was an object illustration for the speak Jesus moment. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. Even if when you're reading that, you're thinking, oh, <laughs> you're in for a shock. You are in for a shock if you think this is going to work out. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Commanded them, stop speaking, please, about Jesus. We can see a miracle happen. We're okay. We are doing food banks. Just please stop speaking about Jesus. We're okay with you doing your youth clubs. We're okay with you doing your kids' clubs. Please stop speaking about Jesus. You're causing us problems. The world embraces a lot of what we do as a church or help people, but there is something so significant about the name of Jesus, the power in the name of Jesus. I think Nicola Sturgeon would probably say, just keep being good, be quiet. Just keep being good and just keep in your corner, be quiet. But we do like that you volunteer and you help people. But this name of Jesus keeps cropping up. This name is Jesus. You just keep your Christianity at arm's length and safe. And and, then just be quiet. Now you get too fiery and too hot to handle. You're not qualified. You know, you received the right training. Shh, shh. Just keep being okay, people. But dare you get bold about Jesus. If we just stop there, if it you think they did, what do you think they did? You could, you don't need to read the Bible. You tell somebody that's got the fire of Jesus and experience and the Lord about him, and you tell them to be quiet. Do you really think they are going to listen? Sometimes the issue is that just the church is not on fire enough. We become weak. Message becomes weak. Would I become too hot to handle? Would become easy to manage? Oh, as long as you die, take our gifted, fail us, we'll surrender all again. But God is doing something in His church, rising up people of boldness or consistency. Because you can't fit there, I want to say, because you can't enough about Peter and John, they're consistent. They're consistent to the beggar, beggar, I speak Jesus. They go to the temple, I speak Jesus. And the third point is, but John and Peter replied, verse 19, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop 
telling about everything we have seen and heard. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. We cannot stop. The reason we cannot stop missions and helping people that's part of the gospel. But the mission of the church should be us. We cannot, we will not stop. We cannot stop telling everything we have seen and heard. We will not shut up about Jesus. Come on. We will be speakers of Jesus. We will love Jesus unashamedly. Oh, just be quiet about him. No. We will shout for the rooftops. We have experienced the love. I've been through the spiritual temple, and I know that God is good, and he's coming back for his church. And I'm sorry, but even if every man said it was false and every government degree said stop speaking about Jesus, Jesus has got a reputation for keeping on living while governments have got a reputation for failing and gone to the du dust. I can't for arm barking. The Jesus that saves us and he is an eternal loving king and he'll outlast every single agenda that tries to shut him up. Every single agenda that tries to keep how many people quiet, Jesus will outlive each and every one. And well, something else will rise up. He's outlived the Roman guards. He's outlived the people that put him in a tomb. He's batted that to the sideways. He's outlived every government, every legislation, every Caesar that ever existed, every Herod that ever, ever existed. They've all lived and died, but I'm sorry, Jesus still is alive, and He reigns forevermore. <clears throat> speak Jesus. In a trial, speak Jesus. You need somebody that's in a need, a prayer. I'm not qualified to pray for somebody that's sick. Speak Jesus. Speak your best prayer. Speak Jesus. Say in the name of Jesus, rise up and get well. We've got nothing else to offer. Speak Jesus. If you're brought before unbelievers and they question you, you don't need to explain yourself. You just need, I believe in Jesus. You can turn to him as well, and times of refreshing will come upon you, and they can tell you to be quiet, and they can tell the church to be quiet, and they can say, just go and be good and nice people. But you say, no, 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 that's not enough for the church to be nice. God didn't they save me to be nice. There's worlds full of nice people. He needs people to tell people about Jesus, that there's only one wire of salvation, and it's through him, and everybody needs a Savior, whether they're doing great in life or something else. We have a wonderful privilege to gather under the name of Jesus every single Sunday and in between. Let's get Jesus on our lips and in our heart. I'm just going to take a moment, and then we're going to sing, Speak Jesus. I want us. Apostle Paul was in chains. And a Roman guard, he says, I'm in cha chains for Jesus. And he says, pretty much, they might chain me in a Philippi jail, but they will never chain the gospel. They might put me in shackles, but they'll never chain the gospel. And there might be a day that ministers, and we can't always meet like us, we might face some jail time. We've got to be so in love with Jesus that even if you stick me in a padded cell, soundproof cell, I will still shout, Jesus, we love you. And if there's somebody listening, and if somebody can hear through the padded cell, he's the only way of salvation and times of refreshing could come upon you as well. I'm going to ask us to sing 
and the mouth that you've gone through without you feeling chains. You're downtrodden, and you thought God was going to answer your prayers, and it's like He is now answered in a while. Still speak Jesus. But before that, I'm going to give you a call for salvation. And the, the question is, now do you want to join our fellowship? We'll so we'll be glad that you do. Will be, do you want Jesus? Yes or no? If you and I go to Jesus, do you want Him? And it's yes, I do. And I promise the same as Peter has torn to Him. And times are refreshing will come upon you. You'll be found in His presence. And I care for what you've done, and I care for how you've done it with you, and I care for your opting your secret life. Turn to Jesus. We'll give a moment for that. Nobody responds. I'm now on an ego trip. It's okay, but it's good to ask a question. Eternity is at risk in people's life. So we'll ask, do you want Jesus? We're going to give a moment for that. And then we'll just got to get the worship band up and speak Jesus. Let's, I usually always muck up at this point. I usually say, bow your eyes and close your heads. <laughs> but, bow your heads and close your eyes. Everybody. And I'm just going to ask a simple question. Do you want Jesus? If you have never responded to Jesus, this is your opportunity. Nobody is looking but me. The reason I'm looking is it's good to see a response so we can for what we're praying for. If it happens is I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance, so I'll say a sentence like, sorry, Lord, I'm in need of forgiveness, and then we'll repeat. It's a starting point. As a starting point for the beggar, as a starting point for me, as a starting point for other people, there was a moment that we said yes to Jesus, we went leaping and dancing and praising God into the spiritual temple, never to come out again. And once He's got you, God loves you, and He's got you with an unconditional, everlasting love. I'm just going to give you a moment. I'm going to ask a question, and I'm going to leave 30 seconds, right? So, you've got a time limit. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to pop your hand and say, yep, include me in a prayer. And if you want to do that, and then we'll pray. So, why every head's bowed and every eye's closed. Is there anybody in here that will respond to the gospel and say, I, yep, I've came, I've listened. I didn't really expect to respond this morning, but I'm responding to Jesus. And if you pop your hand, I will see you, and then you put your hand down, then we'll pray. Okay, I see that hand, that's one, two. I see that hand, you can put it down. One day else, 20 seconds. Do you want Jesus? See your hand at the back, thank you. Well, everything we do at church, this is the most important part. Okay. We're going to pray. I'm going to ask Abdi to know that everybody needs to repentance and everybody needs salvation. Some of us are well saved. I'm just going to ask Abdi to join them to especially encourage them that are praying for the first time because it's a big step. And it's us. The people that have done it, you're Peter, and you're there for the people that's newly here. And you're lifting them up, okay? So just repeat this prayer after me, specifically them as well that put their hands up. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you you sent your Son to live and die for me. I confess I'm a sinner in need of forgiveness. I thank you, Jesus, for those nail-pierced hands. Forgive me, Jesus, for my sin. I believe you are the Son of God, the Son of Man, that came to seek and to save 
that which was lost. Thank you, Jesus, that you receive me into your family. And I pray for times of refreshing to come upon my life. Help me, Holy Spirit, to live for you until I meet you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's hear it for the people that has responded. Best decision you've ever made in your life. If you need to speak to us, if you need a Roshawa, you can go. But especially for them that have responded, please, we'd love to speak to you at the end and tell you about this journey. I'm going to invite the worship team up. We're going to take up our offerings. And then we're just going to speak Jesus. We're going to leave the front open. If you want to come to the front and you just feel the need, there is nothing super spiritual about the front. It can just be the place of less distraction, if I'm honest. It can just be the place of, okay, I'm coming to the front. It's like coming into the temple. It means different things to different people. But you can experience Jesus fully for your act and fully if you was to come. But some people prefer just to... Some people just feel the need to respond in some way. If you feel so, you need to come to the front and just speak Jesus. You come. But Jesus, I want to thank you for taking us into your temple. Every one of us was outside in the 18, these three people that are precious in your sight, and you've made them yours through your precious blood. And we Take a moment to thank you, Jesus, as a fellowship for your salvation, your blood, your love. You're so good to us. Your goodness and mercy will somehow they follow us all the days of our life, and we do not deserve to be followed by goodness and mercy, yet they do. And may our cups now overflow as we boldly and unashamedly speak Jesus and shout Jesus and praise Jesus and love on Jesus in this place. I pray that times of refreshing will come upon your fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen.